Good morning, everybody. Welcome to New Song. We are so glad you guys are here this morning. Would you stand with us? Let's thank God and worship Him for who He is and what He's done for us. We, Lord, we're so grateful for your love. We know that you've gone to extraordinary lengths to show us your love, and we worship you, God. Let's sing together. Here we go. Sing, come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Thank you, Lord. We're coming to you, God. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're searching for. Thank you, Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us, whoever believes in him will live is waiting there with open arms see his open arms for God so loves the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him we believe Lord we live forever the power Things flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. See it again. Praise God, praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. is one and only son to save us whoever believes in will live forever the power of hell forever defeated now it is well i'm walking in freedom for god so love god so is waiting God so loved the world Amen. God thank you for your love for us Lord we know that you gave up your son that he shed his blood on a cross because of that we have power and freedom and healing and life and joy and peace we choose to live in that this morning thank you Sing, I just want to speak his name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart and every mind. 
Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. And I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Your name is power. Cause your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. Thank you. Cause I just want to speak the name of Jesus. To every soul held captive by depression. Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout his name. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Speak Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name Just want to speak the name of Jesus. Jesus, claim it. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We claim your name, God. Shout his name. Shout Jesus from the mountains. Jesus in the streets. 
Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus, for my family, I speak the holy name. Jesus. Jesus, there is no other name, no other name by which we are saved than the name of Jesus. The name at which the darkness flees and our sin and fear is overcome. See, oh, the blood, crimson love, price of lies demand. Shameful sin, Placed on him the hope of every man. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. What a sad. Save my life, yes, the blood, it is my victory. You're our victory, Lord. Save your son, holy one, slain so I can live. Great I am who takes away my sin. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. Oh, the blood of Jesus shed for me. By your blood. Thank you for your love. Oh, what love, no greater love. Grace, how can it be that in my sin? Yeah. 
Jesus, we claim your blood. We claim your victory, Lord. We believe that it's only by your blood that we are saved, only by the death and resurrection of the living God that we have been forgiven of our sins. You have taken our debt. You've taken our shame. You've removed our disgrace and left us with the glory of the risen Lord. Thank you, God. We believe that one day, we will sit with you in heaven, face to face, no more sin, no more pain or sorrow or sadness. All shame and despair will be wiped away for eternity. And all that remains is your light and your glory, the life that flows from you eternally. God, we love you and we worship you. Father, Son, and Spirit, three in one, the eternal almighty, invisible and present with us, the unknowable and the completely known. We worship you, Lord. In your holy name we pray and all God's people say, Amen. thank you. Let's praise him and thank him for who he is and what he's done for us, what he's given to us and made us. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Hello and welcome to New Song. I'm Michaela and I serve in the Mosaic ministry here. Did you know that God has something specific for you today? He knows the deepest parts of our hearts and wants to grow us into the perfect likeness of Christ. If you allow him, he can change everything in your life for the better. Sometimes that process is painful. It might feel worse for a season, but ultimately he will finish the good work he started in each of us. Part of that can happen this morning if you'll allow it. If you are new to New Song this morning, we are also so glad you are here. We consider those at New Song for the very first time VIPs. We have a team that would love to meet you at the VIP table in the lobby. Would you take your connection card that's in your program out there after the service? If you do, they have a gift for you this morning to show you how glad we are that you came. It's a book that answers the five biggest questions people have about God and a cool new song tumbler. If this is not your first time to new song, would you also please fill out that connection card? We ask everyone to do this so we can know that you are here, be praying for you, and hear if you have a spiritual conversation this past week. You can drop those in the offering bags after the message. Hello to those of you joining us online today as well. Please fill out that digital connection card right now along with the live congregation. We are so glad you're here with us online today. Our program is full of events, groups, and services to help you become a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Take a second to look through it and see what might apply to you. While you're doing that, there are a couple things coming up that we want to highlight. Easter is upon us, and it's the most important day on the Christian calendar. It's the day Jesus rose from the dead, bringing life eternal for all who believe. So we're gonna make it super special for all of us this year. We'll have a fantastic celebration right in here. Uh, your kids will get Easter eggs in Promised Land, We'll set up backdrops in that cafe so you can take photos with your family. We'll have tacos in the parking lot. And it's possible that Taylor Swift will be with us that day. But don't count on it. Okay, so the, this part is no joke. Personally, my favorite service of the whole year is always Good Friday. That's when we honor Jesus for making such a sacrifice on our behalf. Uh, to help you imagine it, a while ago, I went to Israel and filmed scenes from the Upper Room and the Garden Tomb and the Garden of Gethsemane, and I'm eager for you to experience those with me. Good Friday services will be 7 p.m. with child care for the young ones, and Easter services will be 9 and 11 a.m. And listen, more people come to church on Easter than any other day, and more people receive Christ on Easter than any other day. So I hope you'll make six or eight or 10 invitations to people you know. And if you need an example of how to invite them, I have one for you right here. Oh, come on, that's not a foul. 
Oh. Wings are ready. Hey, uh, let, me, let me ask you something real quick. Yeah. Go ahead and have a seat. Okay. Hey, um, asking for a friend. Mm -hmm. What would a person's general thought be about scheduling or doing something on, 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 a, on a Sunday? Well, I think, uh, generally speaking, most people like their Sundays to themselves. But asking for a friend. Yeah. What if there was something special about the Sunday, generally speaking? Generally speaking, it'd have to be really special. I mean, like a, like a showstopper. Right, right, right. So what if someone was raised from the dead? I mean, would, would that be showstopper enough? What's bigger than being dead and then not being dead? Right. Right. Yeah. What what if said person was the son of God? Go on. And the miraculous act is through him he could save you from save your... Save you from my what? From your... Sins. Oh. Asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. Do you think a friend would like to go to something like that on a Sunday morning, if invited? Tell your friend mm. that uh, if he doesn't invite somebody to that, he's probably not really a friend. Right. Right? Right. 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 Hey. <laughs> I'm the friend. It was me the whole time. And the Oscar goes to Meryl Streep. I love her. Before we continue to our service, take a second to meet some of the amazing people around you. God intended us to live the Christian life in community, and we should know the other people we're worshiping with. So please stand up now and go make some new friends. Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, in your program, you actually have those two invite cards to also make it a little easier uh, to invite somebody to Easter this year. Let me pray for us as we begin. Father, we pray that you would speak to us during this time, that you would move our hearts, <clears throat> not because of anything that I say, because of what you are going to say we pray that you would make us, make our hearts soft and open our ears so that we can hear from you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. So I want you to imagine a desert. All right, so think about Arizona, think about wherever you've seen desert where there's like no civilization, maybe that stretch from here to Arizona if you've ever driven that before, and you're like, well, when's the next gas station? And you're like, it's like 200 miles away and you better get gas. All right, so imagine that. There's no infrastructure around you. Uh, maybe you're in 29 Palms or something like that for the Marines in the room. So imagine that, and you are tent camping with the rest of your tribe, if you will. And so you have your tent all set up, and everybody's in this nice formation order, and you had just come from a, a meeting that everybody had had. And at that meeting, they had asked you if you had any materials to help build a building. Now, you're in the middle of a desert, all right? And you're asked, hey, what materials do you have? We need to build this tent because our deity wants us to build a tent for him. And you have no resources around you but what you actually own in your tent. And then you have this one neighbor. You know, he's the frugal guy. 
he never gives anything away. In fact, when you make bread, you know, and you share your bread with him, he doesn't share with you. But today, something's different about that neighbor. That neighbor's gathering up some of his stuff, and he's grabbing up some of his extra, his wife's gold earrings, little brooches, and little things that they had, and he's, he's tear, ripping up some of his garments, and he's taking it to the center of the camp so that they can build this tent for God. In the middle of nowhere in the desert, as you look around, you start to see people from all the other tents go in there and start rifling through their stuff because they want to make an offering. They want to contribute to something bigger than themselves. They want to obey the stirring that they have in their hearts, and they bring this offering to God, and they build a dwelling place for him, a place that people can come together and worship the God that had brought them out of Egypt, a God that wanted to be with them in their midst and wanted them to worship together. Today, we're going to look at that story about when God commands his people to actually build something. And so we're going to be in Exodus 25, if you want to turn there uh, here in a minute. But let me review what we're going through right now. As we're going through our two-year initiative, we're going through the four aspects of our, our two-year initiative. And those four aspects, are, I'll remind you, we started this three weeks ago. Is we're trying to accelerate our mission. And our mission here at New Song is to see unchurched people become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, that's not novel. It's not new. We actually take that from the Bible because the Bible has the great commission to go. And we talked about this a couple weeks ago. We are to go and we are to make disciples baptizing the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything that God had commanded. So that's our first thing is we're trying to accelerate our mission, and we did this by challenging everyone to lead somebody to Christ within the next two years. And I will tell you, there's, there's two people I know that have already done that. One person led their uh, uh, air conditioner uh, fixer to Christ, and somebody led their friend to Christ. It was an amazing story from my life group. So we're challenging people to do that, to accelerate our mission. The second thing we're looking to do is to strengthen our spiritual growth. And we're doing that by, as Pastor Hal talked about, is to take the spiritual growth classes. Last week, we talked about deepening our fellowship with one another. And we'll hit on that a little bit more because when we think about fellowship and being with other people, that actually is countercultural because we're so individualistic today that we actually coming together is actually somewhat of a countercultural thing to do. And so I'll, I'll hit on that even more. So we challenged everybody to actually get into a life group. And this week, we're looking for at our fourth and final aspect of our two-year initiative, and that has to do with enhancing our local ministry through building projects, which is quite the interesting topic to look into. And so if you recall a few weeks ago, I talked about this idea of exegesis, where you look at one passage and you pull out the truth that's in that passage. And that's what we typically do here is we march through a book of the Bible like Luke or Ephesians or whatever, and we pull out the text. We do exegesis, all right? Um, then what we can do is we do what's called biblical theology, and we take a theme that we see from that exegesis, and we put it all together. And so we're going to do a biblical theology just very briefly on buildings. Doesn't that sound fascinating? I got your attention now. But it was in my mind, I was like, oh, this is interesting. Like, when does God build, and why does God want buildings? And do we actually need a building to have a church? These are the questions that I got to wrestle with this week. And what's interesting is God cares about buildings. In fact, if you'll just turn with me in your Bible, you're going to need your Bible today. So if you do it digitally or whatever, I just want to show you some interesting things about this. Because uh, if you turn to Exodus 25, and you start just flipping the pages, uh, it's all about buildings for 15 chapters. For like 20 pages of the Bible in this one section, it's talking about about building. The first half is all about building instructions, and this is how you are to build it, and we're going to read some of those together today. And then it talks about the actual building and the workers that come to do that building. So let me give us the context of Exodus 25, but as you'll see in Exodus 25, uh, it says offerings to build the tabernacle. We'll start reading there, but then it goes through the ark, the table, the lampstand, the tabernacle, the altar of burnt offering, the courtyard, the oil lamp, the priestly garments, the breastplate, the ephod, and on and on and on for 15 chapters. I think God cares about buildings. In fact, God really cared about this building, and I'll tell you why here in a minute. But the context of this is the people of Israel had just 
been saved from slavery in Egypt. They were brought out and into that austere uh, area that I was telling you. They are now at Mount Sinai. So I actually have a map of the area so you can kind of see where it is. Uh, you can see on the west side, you see the lo- it says Lower Egypt in the land of Goshen. That's where they were. You'll see a fine red line that kind of goes down the Sinai Peninsula. And once it almost reaches the tip of the Sinai Peninsula, there's a little dot there that says Mount Sinai. And that's where we think that Mount Sinai is. According to tradition, there's actually three different routes of the Exodus that we believe, but this is the one that's traditionally thought of. You go down south, and then you go up north into the Promised Land. So that's geographically where we are. Now, when I told you that this is a really austere area, let me show you a picture of what Mount Sinai would look like. This is where tradition has it. I hope you can see that, but it is like this undulating terrain, lots of hills. There's, I mean, where's your water? Where's your food? I mean, you are, are in the middle of nowhere. No wonder when God gave them manna and God gave them water, it was a miracle that they finally had something to eat and they had something to drink. So this is where they are. And then God is going to say this to them in verse one of chapter 25. So look with me in your Bibles. This is what it says. The Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to bring me an offering. You are to receive an offering for me from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. These are the offerings you are to receive from them. And listen to this detail. Gold, silver, bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and fine linen, goat hair, everyone needs that, ram skins dyed red, and other types of durable leather, acacia wood, uh, olive oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil and for the fragrance incense, and oxnard stones, and other gems to be mounted on the ephod and breastplate. That is quite the laundry list there. Then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. So I just want to highlight just a few things uh, from that passage. Back in verse 2, God tells them to bring an offering. I've already hinted at this. They're in the middle of nowhere, and they're told to bring an offering. So they have to go back to the stuff that they have that they themselves brought out of Egypt. There's nothing they could harvest. There's no wood around. There's really not even any brush around. It is an offering from the people of what they possessed when they left Egypt. Now, when they left Egypt, if you recall the story, it's fascinating because God told them, before you leave Egypt, it says this, God told Moses to tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors, their Egyptian neighbors, for articles of silver and gold. And then it says, when they left, they got those articles and silvers from the Egyptians. It's almost like God already had a plan for this. It's like God had already resourced them with the materials they needed. They brought those materials out there in the middle of the desert. And now God has said, hey, those materials you brought and some of the other things, I'm asking you for those so that you can build me a sanctuary. Notice too, this offering that he asks, it's actually voluntary. It says you are to receive an offering from everyone whose heart prompts them to give. So this isn't something that they're compelling or commanding everyone to do. God later does that by saying, hey, you should bring the tithe. That belongs to the Lord. So the tithe belongs to the Lord. But this offering is supposed to be one that God prompts on your heart to bring forth and participate in this project. It is an invitation from God into the work that he is doing. Now, what I find fascinating with this too is why does God even care about this building? What's this building supposed to be for? Well, verse 8 tells us, then have them make me a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. So here's what that dwelling would look like. We'll put up a picture of it. This is a replica that was made uh, in the desert. So you see it has this outer wall that is kind of built and it's built with some sort of uh, you know, curtain type uh, uh, material. And if you look on the left side of the picture, you see what there's kind of an altar and it has four little horns to it. And uh, there's all sorts of fascinating stuff when it comes to the tabernacle and all the details. If you're really interested, great, read this afternoon, just pick it up, you know, 20 pages on how to actually build this thing, the dimensions, everything is in there. And then you can actually see the tent itself in the middle with those vertical, um, with those vertical curtains. And the only people allowed inside the actual tabernacle, if you will. It, well, it's called tabernacle. It's also a meeting place. But inside there are the priests, and inside there's another set of curtains, and inside that, behind that set of curtains, 
One priest could go, the high priest, once a year, and that would actually be the throne room of God where the Ark of the Covenant was, and they thought that that was actually where God himself would be present and actually sit. And so what we see here is this is what God wants to be built, and he wants this built in the middle of the camp. And we could unpack all of that imagery. It's really interesting. But this teaches us why God wants this built. God desires to be with his people collectively, so he builds a place to meet with them. That's your first point. God desires to be with his people collectively, not individually, collectively, so he builds a place to meet with them. Now that's pretty, that's interesting that God, the God of the universe actually wants to be with his people. He doesn't want something from them per se. He just wants to be with his people. And this tells us something about the character of who God actually is. Because back in the the, uh, book of Genesis, God wanted to be with Adam and Eve. But Adam and Eve sinned and it broke that relationship. And so the whole Bible story is about the presence of God coming back and being with his people. And so finally we see this happening in this book at the end of Exodus, we finally see the presence of God comes. This is what it says at the end of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, that tabernacle I showed you, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it and the glory had filled the tabernacle. The presence of God finally came to that area of the tabernacle. And we think about that, that God desires to have a relationship with you, a relationship with us us. He's just not that God that just sits there and just watches it and pulls the strings. No, he wants to be involved in your life, in your life, in your life, in your life, in your life. He wants a relationship with every single one of us and all of us collectively. Hal already said a joke about Taylor Swift, but I think it would be cool if we actually, if she showed up for Easter and actually met her, right? That would be super cool, if we actually had somebody famous that showed up, I love those videos where like the famous guy like pops out of nowhere and, uh, and, and the kids like hits, hits, hits idol and he just starts crying and the, there's this cool reunion between like a star and the kid. I think that kind of feeling that you see in those kids when you get starstruck because that star wants to meet that child and wants to be with that child, that's that same relationship with us and God is that we should be starstruck that God of the universe actually wants to be in a relationship with with us and pursues after us. He doesn't want to be outside the tent. He wants to be right in the thick. And what's fascinating about that is these people, the Israelites, they're a rebellious bunch. They complain, they whine. Sounds like a bunch of Marines right there. Uh, out in the field. I mean, they're in the desert. I mean, why wouldn't you be grumpy? I mean, my goodness, there's crappy water, all sorts of stuff. So they're out there. And God wants to be with those people. So this is, teaches us a couple things that I think we need to really put uh, into our hearts. Is that, uh, first off, I don't need the approval of anybody else. Amen. If God wants a relationship with me, that's enough. That's enough. I don't need to go around and people please. And I don't need to be fearful of what others think about me because I already have the God of the universe who already I know wants to be in a relationship with me. And that takes some work on your heart to realize how am I actually going around and trying to please others and how other people, when they say something, it affects me. But rather like when I'm in the midst of all of my anxiety and stress and what's going on at work here and we've got that whole project we're doing over there and it's, you know, we're laying carpet this afternoon and it's crazy and I don't know if it's going to get done on time. The people are moving in and that stress is welling up in me. I have a God who wants to be with me a God that loves me. And this isn't some sort of psychological trick that I do to myself. No, this is actually realizing who I am in this world and that I'm a loved child of God and how that should actually affect me and play out in my life. Because that, that project is gonna end in a couple weeks and I'm not even gonna remember it. And that stress that I had, it's gone. So I need to focus on the fact that God wants that relationship with me. And here's the other thing. If God wants a relationship with you, then you may need to change your perspective on God because some people think that God is a cosmic cop and he's going after you and that he's mad at you. Now there is an element of there's consequences for sin and God is wrathful. It says that in the Bible. He hates sin and all of that. But 
there's this idea that sometimes I think that we just think, oh, well, well God would never want me in his church. In fact, I, I met a lady outside the church who said, she was just listening to music, said, you want to come in? She's like, no, no, you, I, I don't belong in the church. I don't, I don't deserve in the church. I'm like, well, you know, I started preaching to her and she left, but I was like, actually, yeah, bad on me, but I was like, actually, this is the, that's actually the whole point of church is like that we all don't belong. Like, we all are sinners. We all are on that same level playing field. So you should come in. We have a God that wants to be with us. Come in and meet with that God. Sometimes we think that we have to clean ourselves up before we come to church. And uh, this just popped in my head. It, it, it's kind of like a dishwasher. Um, you guys know there's different rules in different households for how they deal with dishwashers? You guys know this. And so if I could dime out my in-laws again. Uh, the seeds, which is just so you, if you didn't know, it's a senior pastor. Uh, he's preaching at Carlsbad, but at their house, when we have parties there, uh, you're supposed to, you wash the dishes, and then you put them in the dishwasher. Now, in their defense, Lori's sitting right there, my mother-in-law, she would say, no, we're rinsing the dishes, but doggone it, those are the things are clean, and they go in there, and I'm like, it's a dishwasher. So it washes dishes for you, okay? I'm on the other spectrum. Is like, I don't care what it's gone on. Just throw it in. Let's go. You know, and I was, I was telling my brother, I was like, man, my dishwasher, I need to get a new one. Like, it's not working. It's not washing my dishes. And he's like, Scott, it is a dishwasher. It's not a magic dishwasher, okay, man? You got to scrape some stuff on it, you know? But sometimes when we approach God, I think we say, oh, my goodness, I got to clean myself up before I go into the dishwasher. And that's not what, how the Bible operates. He says just to come just as you are. He wants that relationship with you. You don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to rinse yourself off. You just, he'll do it. Absolutely, Themis. You show up, and this is the time that we can encounter the God who wants to be with us. He wanted to be with his people in the Garden of Eden. They broke that. He wanted to be with his people in the desert, so he made a tabernacle. Eventually, he wants a place to be with his people permanently, and so he creates a temple. And then in the same type of passage, the glory of the Lord fills the temple and King Solomon can't even go into the temple because the glory is so thick that they can't even get close. And the glory of the Lord stays in that temple until the people rebel. And then they're kicked out of their land. Again, that consequence for sin. And the glory of the Lord describes this in Ezekiel, if you want to read it, the glory of the Lord leaves the temple. The presence is gone from that space. So now how does God be with his people? How does he dwell with his people? Well, we just sang about it. Oh, the blood of Jesus washes me. God sends his son to die on the cross for our sins so that we can then dwell with God again. And here's the cool part. God no longer just dwells in a temple. He dwells inside of those that believe in him by the Holy Spirit. God comes and dwells inside of us. And then it actually talks about us being a temple in 1 Corinthians. It talks about us being a temple in two ways. It talks about us being a temple individually. We are the temple of God. And then it uses a great Southern word. It says, y'all are the temple of God. Okay, you guys don't see that in the, the Greek says that y'all. All right, but it says y'all, we together are the temple of God. Amen. And then when we finally get to that end, when we get to heaven, we're gonna be in a place just like Eden. It's another garden. There's a tree of life. There's streams flowing it because that Eden was what we were supposed to be in. And God remakes the heavens and the earth of how it was supposed to be because he wants to dwell with his people. Amen. Now, what else is interesting about this is when I think about if God wants to be with me, how much do I want to be with God? It says, you know, if I have this awesome privilege that God lives inside of me, that the presence of God is around me, I should talk to God. I should make prayer a priority in my life. If I have a God pursuing me, I want to pursue right back. That's how friendships work. And so I want to be that friend to God and pursue him. And I found this when I was reading on prayer this week. It said, prayer is so simple that the weakest child can pray. Yet at the same time, it's the highest and holiest, holiest work that we can ever achieve. It's the highest and holiest work that we can ever achieve. And so I want to see us shift our perspective on prayer. I don't know how much you pray, but it's a joy that you get to come and be with the God that is pursuing you. We just had our 24 hours of prayer, and I was thinking, man, 
Am I, am I have time to go in and pray? That sounds daunting, an hour of prayer. But man, that hour just slips and goes right by because you're finally, you have that privilege of praying and being with God. So the first reason that God wants to build, he desires to be with his people collectively, so he builds a place to meet with them. The second reason, this is in your notes, God builds a place for his people to gather them to worship. There's actually needing a gathering place so that they can actually worship. And so it's in the center. And so if you work through the book of Exodus uh, into next book is Leviticus. It just keeps getting better here. Uh, Leviticus is all about the different offerings, the different ways you worship. And so chapter one is the burnt offering. Chapter two is the grain offering. Chapter three is the fellowship offering. Chapter four is the sin offering. And on it goes on the different offerings that are there. And so again, God is very detailed. He cares about these different offerings at that time. And so he builds the tabernacle so that people can worship with him together collectively. And I said that that is somewhat of a countercultural thing because there's a lot of us that, that feel that you know, we're so individualistic. We all have our own bank accounts. We all live our own lives. We have our own schedules. And so uh, why can't I just stay at home and just watch like amazing preachers online and just do church that way on like a Tuesday where it's more convenient for me? And I will say there are amazing preachers. And so if you come here for the preaching, <laughs> okay. Um, but there's amazing preachers on there. You don't come here necessarily for the preaching. You come here, well, you come here for the preaching because I understand somewhat what it's like to live in Southern California. And I can apply that to our lives here in Southern California. But you come here because you can listen to God's word next to somebody and you hear that same message and you can process it with the people that are in here together. We do this together. Same thing with when we come and we worship and we sing songs together. There's something different than singing in your car and singing together here. There's something about this community, this space where we become one voice and you're encouraged when you see other people praising God and just pouring out their hearts to God. You know, we're also happy that we have people that get to join us online, and I know there's a lot of new songers that join us uh, online because uh, they're either sick or they're traveling or they've moved, and so we love that, that people do that. Uh, and there's people that also just check us out online, so I acknowledge that, and there is a, there's an element to gathering also online, but if you've watched online and you've been in the room and have a chance to be in this space, that's how God designed us to be together in community. It even says we're not supposed to give up on the habit of meeting together. In fact, the New Testament church news, they met together collectively and they set that example for us. God builds a space to meet together. So you could argue, you could argue, and I read this, that you actually don't need a building to have a church. And that's absolutely true. We as a community are the church and we can meet in a park and still be the church. We can meet in a school and still be the church. Okay, there's nothing special per se about this building that makes it the church. Rather, it's the gathering, it's what it does. Buildings are just really, really nice to have because they're convenient, they keep the, well, we don't have snow here, so the runtime it rains, you know, we actually have cover uh, for that. And that's why God builds buildings so people can actually meet and worship him together. So now let's look at how God actually builds this building. So we have to fast forward a little bit in our chapters in chapter 25, we read the offerings to build the tabernacle. He gives instructions, and man, if you want to read these instructions, just let me read just one verse for you. It says, and they are to make the ark of acacia wood, 45 inches long, 27 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Overlay it with pure gold, overlay it on the inside and out, and make moldings of gold all around it. That's the kind of instruction, the detailed building plans that he gives, and on and on and on. You can read those in the next eight chapters or so, and then we finally get to chapter 35, and there's a heading there, so if you're, if you're following me in your Bible, the Bible's underneath the chairs, page 79, at verse, chapter 35, verse 4, there's a heading that says, building the tabernacle. So we have about eight chapters of just instruction on how to build this thing, and we finally get to when he's going to do it, and so I want you to listen. There's three different sections here I'm going to read. The first section is going to be about um, the offering that he takes, uh, talks about again. Then he talks about the people that he needs to build this. And then he actually talks about, um, oh, what's my third section? 
Oh, he talks about people's hearts that are moved will be the ones that actually do this building. So I'm going to read quite a bit of scripture here, but verse 4, this is what it says. Chapter 35, verse 4. Then Moses said the entire Israelite community, this is what the Lord commanded. Take up an offering among you for the Lord. We've heard this before. Let everyone whose heart is willing bring this as the Lord's offering. Gold, silver, and bronze, pur- blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, fine linen and goat hair, ram skins dyed red, and fine leather acacia wood, oil for the light, spices for the anointing oil, for the fragrant incense, and the oxnard with gemstones to mount the ephod and breastplate. That's exactly what we just read. It's just in a second place in the Bible. Then he says, let all the skilled artisans among you come and make everything that the Lord had commanded. And then he's going to list it. He's going to say the tabernacle, it's tents and covering, it's claps, it's support, it's crossbars, it's pillars, it's bases. Uh, And on and on it goes until about verse 20. And then verse 20 says this. Then the entire Israelite community left Moses' presence. Everyone whose heart was moved and whose spirit prompted him came and brought an offering to the Lord for the work on the tent of meeting for all its servants and its holy garments. Both men and women came. All who were wearing, all who were with willing hearts brought brooches, earrings, rings, necklaces, and all kinds of jewelries. Everyone who, who presented a, everyone who presented a presentation offering of gold to the Lord. And it keeps going on and on about them bringing this offering. So let me highlight just a few things about that. As I talked about, we saw again that offering, that voluntary offering uh, is done. And what's really cool is it moves into all the artisans that are supposed to do it. And if you read in there, God actually gives special gifts to people to do his work. And he still does that today. Special gifts to people to do his work. There's artisans that come that can actually build this. And then we see finally that uh, it, it is they moved in the hearts of the people. And God actually still moves in the heart of people today for building projects. In fact, you know, a couple weeks ago, I don't know if you, the lighting has been different. You may see us kind of playing with them, trying to figure them out. That's because somebody donated money for new lights in here. We had the best technology that like, you know, 1990s could give you with lights so it's time for a little bit of an upgrade. And so actually, Brian and the worship pastor have been working super hard to fix this whole beam up here, add in new lighting so that there's color so that you can actually see me a lot better. In fact, the online people will probably notice I'm more lit up uh, than usual, and so there's not dark spots. Uh, and so he actually installed a, a whole other rack of lights that are back there. Uh, it was amazing. But it's all because God moved in somebody's heart to give voluntarily to that project. God still does that today. A couple other things. They bring these offerings to him and they do what's called a wave offering. And so they actually wave their offering in front of the Lord. It's different than the burnt offering because you don't want to burn all these materials and then you have nothing to build with. So you wave in front of God showing him this is what we got. Here's what we brought and you give it. And it's fascinating to me that in the text, it mentions men and women. It mentions men and women specifically Typically in the Hebrew and the Greek, it uses kind of the male word or male pronoun to represent both genders. It'll say man. As we've seen kind of an old English, it says man. It means both men and women. So more modern translations will, will pick up on that and say, oh, he's actually talking to everyone. Let's put men and women there. But here I checked when it said men and women, it wasn't just the generic word for man. It specifically used the word for women in the Hebrew to denote that, yes, it's supposed to be both men and women that are working. It is everyone who God had stirred in their heart, both men and women were supposed to come and bring their offerings. It was a community effort. Everyone had to play their part. And what we learned from this is how God builds. And here's how God builds. He invites us into his work and asks us to sacrifice our talents, time, and money. God invites us into his work and asks us to sacrifice his t- our talents, time, and money. It's fascinating. This is the God who created the universe with saying, let there be light, and there was light. Why didn't he just say, let there be my tabernacle? And there the tabernacle was. God didn't choose to do that. He didn't choose to just buy his power, which is there's no restriction on, just build it, boom. He could have snapped his finger and there was the tabernacle. Instead, he chose to go through his people, to stir in the hearts of specific people, to fund this, to bring forth the offering, and also to actually do the work. So there's something I think God is teaching the people here and that God teaches us is that he invites us into his work. He just doesn't do it. He invites us all to participate with him and what he has going on and the work that he is doing. 
And I think that is a joy that God actually lets us into this. We get to be part of something that's bigger than ourselves and join God in the work that he is doing. Also, this passage, as we've already talked about, it's, it's then he, he stirs in certain people's hearts to come bring those offerings. And we've talked about how it's a voluntary contribution. And that's actually how we're going to go forth with some of the projects that we want to fund here at New Song is they're going to be voluntary contributions. We're going we're to invite you to give to that. And if God stirs in your heart, then you obey and you give. And you know, and sometimes when I think about giving and I think about the situation we're in Southern California and how expenses are pretty high, my dad always reminds me gas prices in Missouri are like $2 and whatever. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to the beach, dad. <laughs> so, and it's not, it's not 20 degrees. So it's like we pay for a beach membership or something. But sometimes I feel like I get into this funk where I say, you know what? I mean, the ex- expenses, it's just not working. Like I can't give. And I know for me, what that's code for is I can't give and keep my current level of spending and lifestyle up. Amen. Ouch. So what I have to do is I actually have to go back to my expense and say, what, what are we spending, hey, hey babe, what are we spending our money on? Like, let's take a look at this. And I do find that there's margin sometimes. You know, I do have some mouths to feed and, you know, but there's some margin there. And so I have to realize when I say sometimes that I can't give, it's because I don't want to give because I want to maintain the lifestyle that I have. And I have a pastor friend who's down in uh, San Diego and he's like, yeah, I just like to give till it just hurts a little bit, just, just a little bit. And I thought, whoa, have, have I ever given to a point where I had to sacrifice something? I mean, that's a challenging thought to have. And in fact, this whole new song as a church, which started 30 years ago, started with huge sacrifices. People just going all in saying, we're going to tithe every single week. We're going to sell this. We're going to give this money to the church. I mean, it's been an amazing story. If you watch God's faithfulness to new song and how this church started out, it was because of a core group of people that have been super generous and they're still generous with this church even to today. So what I'd like to just do is, as just a way of introduction, we're not going to ask for money today, but I just want to tell you about some of the projects that we have on our list that we're hoping to do within these next two years. It's part of it. And the good news is about five of them we're already working towards. They're in your notes, and so I'm just going to briefly walk you through these. You'll hear more about these in the future. This is just our introduction to the things that we see that God is doing at New Song to the physical building. The first one is installing the, that solar on our roof. That has already started. We're like in the last couple uh, inspections before that actually starts, and that will bring the cost uh, of our electricity way down, as those of you who have solar know. We're also starting that shared office space that's over uh, on this, this side of the building, and I alluded to that and all the fun anxiety I have about that, and we're laying carpet today and those sorts of things, but that is going to be awesome because we're going to invite a Christian organization that God has really blessed called Dynamic Church Planning International, and they're going to use that office space. They're actually going to lease it from us, and eventually we will have profit from that that we can use to put back into ministry here, and that organization God has blessed too. And so I feel like we're taking New Song and this other organization, bringing us under the same roof. That's going to be a powerhouse because that uh, organization has planted over a million churches in like the last 20 years. And they also want to plant 10 million churches in the next couple of years. So it's an amazing organization that's going to be joining us in over there. We'll have amazing missionaries that will meet in that side of the building. And we're also opening it up to all sorts of other companies, hoping to bring in uh, other uh, revenue so that we can put it back into ministry here in New Song. We've talked about starting that preschool. Uh, the funding is still some required because we've got to build a fence for that, but we're working towards that. Uh, refurbishing the kitchen at our Carlsbad campus, they've got a sweet 1970s kitchen over there. I mean, if you want to have like a, whoa, what is this? This is like grandma stuff. Yeah, go over there and you'll see it. It's amazing. Um, I wasn't around in the 70s, but now I know. So, uh, they're going to refurbish that, and they're working towards getting permits. That, that project is well underway. That one actually has been mostly funded by that Carlsbad campus. Uh, the lighting in the auditorium, uh, we had that first gift that came in, and that's what started Brian to say, hey, let's do some lights, man. I got some money. And so he started buying lights, and well, he kept buying lights, and he kept buying lights, and uh, the electrician looked in the panel and was like, oh my goodness, what is this? And so he's got to come and fix the panels and all that stuff, stuff that I don't know about, but it's apparently a train wreck back there. So you got to fix that, you know, it's the 90s, who knows what they did. 
Then here's what we're looking forward to doing is uh, re-roofing the Carlsbad building. Uh, it's actually just shingles. So if you like shingle stuff, which I do, uh, get up there and re-roof. The problem is they have like three layers of shingles on it already, <laughs> which means they probably haven't sh done that roof in probably 50 years because, you know, it's like we do in Missouri. You put one on, you slap another one on top, you're good for another 20 years and you're not supposed to, but you can slap another one on top and get another 20 years. But anyway, uh, so we got to strip all that out and do some work there. And so that's a big project we're looking to do. Uh, we're looking at these, these chairs. Some of them have been around since the early 2000s. And so we're trying to replace some of those chairs, especially the ones that got all the wax that dripped on them. Every time we do that wonderful Christmas Eve service and sing Silent Night, apparently you people are just doing this or something. I don't know. It's the kids. We'll blame the kids. Uh, also, the venue room that we have over there, I mean, it it's needs some upgrading and some work uh, as well. It's a great space, and we have our Spanish congregation that meets in there. Uh, some of the Ukrainians are going to meet in there, uh, but it's just it's needing a little bit of help in some of its decor, and uh, it's been a while since we touched that. And then the other one is, man, our HVAC units, our, our AC, like those are like original this building. Like this thing was built in the 80s, and so some of those are from the 80s and just need some work. And, even one of them, the heat went out, and I was like, Cyrus, winter's almost over, man. Just keep going. We're just don't worry about it. So we're waiting to fund that one to get that one fixed. Those are just some of the projects that I just want to tell you about that we are working. A lot of them are, this is the project part, so a lot of them are internally focused, maintenance focused on things that we want to do here in the building. A lot of the other parts of the initiative are actually externally focused, supporting that church planter and things like that. And we still do all the ministry with the, the, uh, the Easter, the Halloween Fest, all of those different things. This is just another aspect of this that I wanted to talk about. So in sum, we talked about that God desires to be with his people, and so he builds a building. God desires that the people we gather together, we actually gather together to worship him. And then how God does this, he actually does it in the hearts of individuals by prompting them to give and bring that offering of what they already have and to sacrifice some of their talents, time, and money to see these projects done. But it's all because God wants to be with us. And so if you've never, ever experienced God being with you, I'd like to give you that opportunity today. And what it is, it's, this makes you a Christ follower. And we have to realize, as I talked about, that that relationship with God got broken in that garden in Genesis 2, where the first sin, and we know that all of us have made mistakes, and that actually means that uh, we have to pay for that. It's like a parking ticket. Uh, you have to pay for that. And so either you go to jail or you pay the parking ticket. But thanks be to God that he came, he sent his son to die on the cross to take our place. And as we approach Good Friday, that's what we celebrate on Good Friday, that Jesus came and died in our place. An amazing story. Amy once had a parking ticket because she ran a red light. And uh, it was Good Friday. She, had that, she paid for that ticket, and it was stamped on it, paid in full. That's what Jesus does with our sins. He puts that stamp on He says, those sins are are paid in full because my son came and died on the cross for them. And then you put your faith in him and believe that he did do that and you follow him as your master, as your Lord, as your commanding officer. So how you do this is I'm gonna lead everyone in prayer. So if you'll bow your heads and close your eyes. We're just gonna admit that we have made mistakes, we have sinned, we have disobeyed God, that we need a savior and we want God to be that Savior. So pray with me. If you've never invited Jesus into your life, you've never had him come clean you from your sins, you thought you've had to clean yourself or something, pray this with me. Say, dear Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner and that I'm in need of a Savior. I believe Jesus died on the cross to be my Savior. I invite him into my life and I will follow him the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And then we always love to celebrate if somebody actually prayed that prayer for the very first time. We like to just recognize you by you just putting your hand in the air. So if you prayed that prayer, would you just wave at me and let me know that you prayed that prayer for the first time? Is there anybody that had prayed that prayer for the first time? It's usually a regular thing around here. Is there any hands? Anybody pray that for the first time? Okay. We're going to move on now to our discussion questions. And so, again, if we're going to be a community, you've got to talk to one another. So I'd love for you to meet your neighbor if you haven't met them. Uh, and then you're going to ask two questions. What stood out to you? And then which project uh, kind of excites you or is interesting to you?
Okay, so what stood out to you, and then which project is interest, interests you or excites you? I'm going to give you three minutes to discuss this. Ready, set, go. Bring it back together. So we're going to move into a time where we are going to respond to what we heard. And so we will be passing around the offering bags. Stay seated until the offering bags come by. Then you're welcome to stand up and sing this last uh, song to the Lord. And we talked about God who wants to be with you and wants to hear from you. And so if you want to pray about anything uh, that is going on in your life, uh, you can come up and receive prayer. There'll be prayer partners here who would love to pray with you about whatever is going on uh, in your life. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you that you are such a gracious God and that you desire to be with us. We pray that you would speak to us, continue to speak to us and work on our hearts today, God. And we do thank you for this building that you have given us, God. We pray that you would help us to use it well and for your glory, God. And we thank you for the sacrifices in the past, the sacrifices that people made in the present, and the sacrifices that people are going to make in the future to continue the work you want to do with New Song in this corner of Oceanside, in San Diego County, up to Temecula, and even into the world beyond, God. We thank you that you invite us to work with you, God, and we thank you for that opportunity. 
Thank you for those that have generous hearts and that give generously, God. I pray that you would bless them in a special way this week. It is in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let faith arise In spite of what I see, Lord, I believe But help my unbelief, I choose to trust you No matter what I feel, let faith arise Let faith arise for my champion's not dead, he is alive. Oh, and he already knows my every need. Surely he will come and rescue me. Sing God, miracles come. We need your suit. Natural love to break through. Nothing's impossible. You're the God of miracles. Let faith.
Hey, before we leave, uh, we are a military town, and it's almost PCS season, which is, you know, permanent change of station, which means military members come and military members go. And so we're losing a family this week. Uh, Theodore, is he in here? He's, he's right over there. Yeah, he and his family. Were you guys PCSing too? Quantico, okay, in Belvoir. So they're going to be going to the other coast uh, where it does snow. Uh, so we need to pray for them. Uh, they've been a part of this church. And he's been working down at Balboa. So let's just pray for him. If you'll just extend a hand over here, let me pray for them. God, we pray for this family that has just been serving you mightily in the military. God, and we just pray that as they, they do the trek this Tuesday across the entire United States, God, we pray for traveling mercies. We pray for all the goofy stuff that can happen with their shipments and all of that. And so we just pray that there'd be peace on them, that they would get to um, Quantico and Bellevue as they need to, God. And we just pray that they'd be able to find a great community over there on the other coast, God, that they can thrive. And we thank you for the work that you've done in their lives and the part that they have played in New Song. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. So may the God who desires to be with you, who made a way to be with you, go with you this week as you love and serve him. Amen. Have a great week.